Today on our webinar, we're going to be talking about securing your software supply chain using observability. Hot new topic. So we've assembled our panel of experts from software, security and data to talk about observability and what it means to your software supply chain. So when we talk about your software supply chain, we're talking about all the steps to go that go into building your software, all your third party dependencies, your open source data. And we and there's a huge amount of risk involved in your software supply chain. Even a small application can have thousands of dependencies. Securing your software supply chain means having visibility into your supply chain and how that software is built. And this is where observability can come into play. Observability tools are sort of the next generation of monitoring tip tools driven by automation and remediation. They can ask hidden questions about the unknown unknowns hidden in your data. And what we want to know what can this do for your software supply chain? Hopefully it can help us secure it. <laughs> so today we want to hear from you. We want to hear who you are, where you're coming from, what kind of work do you do? Do you work in uh, SRE in DevOps and software development, let us know. And if you have any questions, that's pure gold. So we want to hear all that. If you're on our um, streaming platform, it's really obvious what you do. But if you're on Twitter, tweet us. If you're on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, comment in our stream. So we're going to be conducting polls, a few polls throughout this. And so again, for, for Twitter, tweet us. For the other platforms, just comment in the stream. So our moderator today, Hilary, is going to be giving those questions back to me. So we really want to hear from you. We're also going to be randomly drawing a few prizes. There's two prize packs and two free lunches at the end of this webinar. So stay till the end if you can. And if you want to watch this on demand, you can go to clausewood.com forward slash blog after this. Now, so let's bring up our, our three guests. This is who we, this is what it's all about. So if you can come on stage, don't be shy. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, so we have, <laughs> this is our crack team. We have Claire Byrne from the data world. She's our data magic practitioner. She's a software security, she's a security data engineer from Elastic working in Belfast. But she's also a community organizer and collaborator in the tech industry. She's the founder of Women Tech, Women Tech Makers Belfast and the co-organizer of Security B-Sides Belfast. Then we have Tom Gibson, our senior staff engineer from CloudSmith. And if you hear his dog snoring in the background, don't worry. It's actually, I think he's wearing his AirPods, his AirPods today. So I'm, I'm sad to see you. <laughs> And last but not least, we have Josh Brazzers. He's the VP of security from Anchor. He's also a blogger and a podcaster from Open Source Security Podcast. And he's someone who's been talking about um, your software supply chain before it was cool. So <laughs> thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're really happy to have you guys today to tell us about what you think of observability and your software supply. I, I actually can yeah, hear your dog work. <laughs> Everybody's wondering, yes, yes, that is someone snoring. Hopefully it's not like a, a guest snoring. So it's always, you know, it's a step up. <laughs> so before we, let's start with um, getting some feedback from um, our people listening. We wanna, if you can participate in the poll. And again, if you're on Twitter, you tweet. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on um, YouTube or Facebook, you just comment in the stream. So our first polling question is, are you currently using observability or monitoring tools? And if so, how many? Because we did hear that people are using like a good few monitoring tools. So um, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get that from you. And we'll talk about that later. So let's, let's crack on with our, with our first question. So um, I thought I'd put the first question to Claire. So I want to know like, what is observability and how is it like different to those traditional data monitoring tools? Yeah, so um, observability is more or less defined as being able to judge the state of the system based on its outputs um, and gain ac actionable insights into the state of your tools, like root cause analysis of issues and 
context into why your software is behaving like it is. So for most observability use cases, three types of data matter the most, logs, metrics, and traces, because these can provide a sort of holistic picture of your, your organization's resources. Um, so yeah, as most of you already know, like logs are files that record events, um, contextual information, um, and such as the time an event occurred and everything. So they're an excellent source of visibility. Um, metrics are like quantifiable measurements that reflect the health and performance of your applications and infrastructure. Um, so for example, C CPU or memory resources. Um, and traces are like, is, is data that tracks an application request as it flows through the various parts of an application. So like, for example, uh, recording how long it takes each application component to process a request and pass the result to the next, next component. Yeah, and Tom, like uh, software developers traditionally use these kind of tools, like they are already using observability tools. I'm sure we are in CloudSmith, and they're kind of more used for like checking if you're available and sort of performance issues. Is that is that right? It's like that's what's the, the main yeah, use case Yeah, I think moment, it's, it's certainly an element of it. Like certainly our own internal use case, as is the case with many, many other organizations, we we rely heavily on observability platforms to help indicate to us the health of the service um, and use it almost to, as, a, as a pointer, as a point of reference when it comes to diagnosing issues, um, trying to understand the performance of the applications. And, you know, some of the points that, that Claire touched on uh, and mentioned about the pillars and traces being one of them, that's probably our bread and butter, aside from the log side of things and, and all that, you know, they, they, they influence our, our approach to trying to understand how things are going heavily. Um, and we heavily try and instrument all parts of the service and leverage distributed tracing across the board where we can. Um, it it makes, makes a big difference. Yeah, like, and if you're currently like tailing logs to get this information, very sad, um, are you, like, is it hard to get started? Like, do you have to change your data to when you're, when it's being consumed by these tools or do you have to tag everything? What do you have to do? Um, so I'll, t I'll take that one. Oh, thanks, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> um, so in general, you'll want to, you'll want to send your logs to your observability tool, but, um, in general, it will perform the heavy lifting for you. It can like aggregate and filter and organize your logs or whatever, um, based on a schema that you define. So for example, in Elastic, there's Elastic Common Schema, um, which you can, you can like orchestrate yourself. Oh, cool. So you can set up your own schema. Like if you don't need to change how you're currently logging stuff like. Yeah, cool. OK, uh, so now um, what about in? Oh, we have some results back. So for about how many tools are you actually using for observability? So most people are using an observability and one or two. So that's that's pretty good. But some people are using over five observability tools. That seems like a lot. That's, that's a lot of that's tools. Too many tools. <laughs> <laughs> can't do, can't do, we have a lot of tools here as well, so we we, we can't look down at anybody. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so moving on. So what what problems are security teams using observability tools for? Like even like the wider security problem. Maybe Josh, you can kind of help us out there. Sorry, Josh, I'm just wondering. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. I mean, so that's that's a great question. I think this is where you can look, kind of look at some of the work Elastic has done. So kind of full disclosure, I, I was previously at Elastic before coming to Anchor, so I've got so you, you uh, a great deal of love in my heart for everything they're doing. It's, it's, it's a fantastic company and product. But when we think about observability, there's often this kind of focus on logs and Logs are super important. I'm not going to say they're not. And obviously, if you look at the history of nearly every modern observability tool, it has its roots in logging. But we also realized some time ago that we can start ingesting all this extra data. You can bring in observability data. You can bring in things like data from your SIM, your security in, security incident event monitor. I forget what SIM stands for. It's been a, it's been a long day. But <laughs> there's things like your firewall details. You've got bits and pieces from network monitoring tools from from your antivirus from like a million places anywhere you can get the data from you can now start bringing this in and adjusting it and i think this is where 
this particular webinar really piqued my interest because CloudSmith brings up the, the, the supply chain and observability. And I'm like, this is a perfect fit because when we think about our software and our supply chain, it's just part of the data because the data all comes together and tells a story, right? And your software supply chain is part of that story that to date, I would say, has not been getting the attention in this way that I think it should be. And so I'm very excited to see where this can go. And like, what when we talk about the software supply chain, what are the elements in it, and why is it why is it so risky? Why why is it difficult to find out what components are in your software? It seems like we should know that. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, it is easy to say that, but I don't think that is necessarily how it, how this has worked out over time. If we look at, I'll, I'll pick on Log4j, right? Because that's all we all remember Log4j like it was yesterday, and we have this incident. And then everyone says, how can we, how, how do we know where log4j is? Why didn't we know this before? And that's very easy to kind of pick on and say, we should have known this. But the reality is, I mean, it's just part of maturing every organization. I mean, there was a time we didn't have logs from all of our computers, right? All of the servers in the server room, no one knows, whatever. Just SSH in and cap the log file, it's fine. I was and just that, configured that out, you know, like, yeah. it, it's like you have an incident and you look back and you're like, oh, we didn't have that turned on. <laughs> exactly, exactly that. And that doesn't cut it anymore, right? And and that's fine. That is just how all of this works together. And so I think from the supply chain perspective, it is relatively new and we have a lot of learning to do. And I just think putting all these pieces together is is the next step where don't say, why weren't we doing this? Because, well, we, we just weren't. So who cares? Like, how do we start? I think is the better question to start asking. Yeah, and so, uh, Tom, what kind of data should we start generating in order to answer some of these questions? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of work in this space right now. I think um, what Josh has said is, is very much the case. It's a, it's a novel area, you know, um, prompted heavily by, you know, incidents of late, such as log for j such as, uh, as, 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 well, innumerable things, right? But we're we're starting to to try and take a, a an understanding now of what goes into a piece of software and and what that actually means for us. Um, so today, you know, there's there's a variety of ways we can do that. Some of our audience will have heard the term S bomb. I'm sure Josh knows it inside and out. <laughs> but it's um, you know, S bomb is a is a really you know is a good starting point for some of this stuff because. It, like, like to, to, to take it back a little bit, we're talking about a bill of materials for software. So essentially, you know, the manufacturing industry, and I've used this on several webinars now, so apologies for anyone else who's seen this, but, you know, the manufacturing industry has, has used uh, bills of materials for a very long time. You know, you, they, there has to be an awareness and an understanding um, of what goes in to build a product. Um, a manufacturer of a mobile device, for example, they, they understand it's made up of a of a display of some sort, components that make up the main board, a speaker, that kind of thing. Uh, and they'll source those components from external and some of those they'll build in-house. Software is no different in that respect. Um, we're looking at pieces of software that can be sourced from the public domain um, by great contributors out there, uh, as well as other organizations. And there, whilst that's amazing, it also brings an element of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say distrust, but certainly deserving of a bit more scrutiny um, and, and Log4j is a very good example of that. You know, it's heavily used across the board in a variety of different projects. And I think to get that sort of information into your observability pipeline, bombs are a really good place to start. Um, you've got information in there containing things like the third party dependencies. Um, and, you know, those those are usually referred to using identifiers such as Perl or SWIDs or something along those lines. Um, but you know, there, there, there's a variety of other other approaches as well, and generally, kind of starting at the source is probably the like they talk about shift left security, right? You've heard it many many times, many of us have, but it's true in the sense that you know the the the, the later something is done about things, the, the more damage that it, it tends to to, to the, the bigger wake that it tends to create. So, given given more observability into this stuff from the outset is is no bad thing, and you know we can. Such information vulnerabilities, for example, about about um, third party dependencies, the number of third party dependencies. This is all information that tends to be produced by these sorts of reports, and they make great candidates for injecting into observability and you know, treating like anything else that goes into those platforms. We can 
uh, model SLOs, or sorry, SLIs about those. We can track things on, a, on alerts and alarms. We can do license compliance check-in, all this kind of useful stuff that's very useful for security teams. But I think in general, we're starting to see an approach that security doesn't just rest with security teams. We're starting to see it that it's becoming a practice across um, both uh, security data um, and engineering teams as well and disciplines. And I think that's important to continue. Yeah, actually, Josh, coming from um, the security space, do you find that like your security teams are working closer with your developers or is it like, oh, we set the policies, we just hand it to the developers? Is there more, um, is there more communication there now? I think there is. I think we've seen a definite shift over the last probably 10 to 20 years of it used to be very much the security team was over here, the developers are over here, no one likes each other, and so we're going to avoid one another as much as possible. And <laughs> and that's definitely not what I see anymore. But I think more importantly even is when you look at some of the kind of smaller and, and new startup-y type organizations that might have only a dozen people, you're seeing the developers kind of doing a lot of this legwork where they're they're you know running the vulnerability scans themselves or using github's dependabot for example they're they're the ones doing the work and i think what i what the vision i have is that we make a lot of this tooling so easy and so good that you don't need a security team like doing all the work the security team is there to define policy and help with problems but fundamentally you're going to see the developers actually kind of picking this up and i mean i'd, I'd even kick this over to elastic is this is exactly what you're seeing with with just the amazing product that Elasticsearch has morphed into. Is it used to be very much like you had one group doing all the care and feeding, but now all the I mean Claire can certainly comment on this. Now you you're seeing the individual business units and groups actually doing the data analysis and ingesting the data, which is amazing. It's so And cool. actually Claire's title is like data security engineer. So you're sort of a hybrid role yourself. Yeah, it's it's funny because um you, you said that we have guests here from uh, the data, the security, and the engineering world, and all three. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with security. I only needed doing... you. I only... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm dealing with security data. I'm dealing with the architecture of that data. I'm dealing with like software engineering problems on a daily basis. Um, and that kind of reflects, it, as on an individual basis, it reflects where the organization of Elastic is going, because we have both security and observability tools in the one product now and it's really cool it's, uh, because security like monitoring security means monitoring your data nowadays because there's just so much data everywhere absolutely and actually let's start our next poll seeing as we're we've kind of touched on vulnerabilities i don't know uh, my trusty sidekick there hillary in the background ah there see that it's magic so our next poll is on, are you happy with your workflow for finding vulnerabilities in your software supply chain? So it's a touchy topic. Um, so if you're on Twitter, tweet us what you think. If you're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, comment in the stream, or if you're on our platform, you just, you just click our poll. So um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. So, um, um, have for for the software supply chain, what kind of questions do you think that we'll be able to ask and observe? I'm like, I see an observability deal. I kind of think it's like Alexa. Be like, <laughs> am I vulnerable? Are <laughs> Alexa? I don't know. That that's my dream. So, uh, <laughs> but Claire, can you imagine? Like, say you get all this data in, this new vulnerability pops up. Are these kind of these questions that you can ask your vulnerability tool that were not necessarily thought of as you were generating the data? Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, so I can only talk about what I know, which is Elastic. So I promise I'm not like just just advertising. For Elastic <laughs> no. But Elastic really... uses open telemetry anyway. So you kind of it's yeah. it's more generic anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But um, one cool thing is that um you can ingest security data but then like have have that all correlated um within the observability product so like it can tell you like it can pinpoint when exactly uh, a vulnerability like was introduced into your into your security into your supply chain um it can tell you like if that vulnerability was exploited and it can tell you like who exploited it um 
if you have your your logging and observability set up right um it's just it's really cool and i really love the i really love where observability tools in general are going on this front because i think it's presenting a a unified way of like just collating all your data to provide a defense basically against yeah attackers. and uh, do you find in elastic that you're moving away from the sort of uh, what is it the visual not vi not moving away from visualization but uh these dashboards is it more about like remediation and automation as opposed to something actionable rather than displaying on a dashboard and have someone monitor that how, how like is is that where you see the future to be or uh, yes absolutely um so for example in elastic security you can open cases um and like trace where a vulnerability is happening like i said and you know like uh log like data as you find it so you can basically set up a security remediation case like as you as you find it you know um oh, that's really cool. Cool. um and it, it means that analysts don't have to you know stare at dashboards all day and yeah. um, <laughs> you know get, get alert fatigue and everything um so that kind of automation is really really useful um just and helps to provide a layered a layered defense model i guess yes yeah so, Anna, Josh, do you think, like, in the future, using these observability, observability tools that would actually be able to, like, prevent a supply chain attack? So a supply chain attack is something that um, uh, it's an attack on your supply chain. So maybe it's malware and your dependency or it's a vulnerability that's exploitable. Uh, so and do you think that using these tools, having this visibility, having these sort of, like, uh, machine learning tools, could they prevent an attack or is it all about detection and uh, fixing it as quickly as possible? <laughs> so I would answer your question with a, uh, it depends, which is of course the favorite answer to all questions. Yeah. So I don't see a lot of observability tools directly stopping an attack in the regards you might think of where an attacker is actually like coming in and doing a thing and then you have a tool paying attention because prevention in that regard is actually very, very difficult to do. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it is incredibly hard. But I would say from the concept of preventing a bad thing, I would think of it more as when you have tools that are paying attention to what's going on, you can, for example, say, okay, I see this vulnerability just appeared in my product before I shipped it. Now I can use that knowledge to prevent a vulnerability from entering my supply chain essentially. And then, but I mean, you could, is that stopping it? I mean, we could argue that probably for hours, but there's, I think that aspect of it. And then there's also the angle of, for example, you might have a developer who includes a dependency that then pulls in hundreds of other dependencies beneath it. And so you can look at your tools and say, whoa, why did we just pick up 700 dependencies yesterday? Something weird is going on. And that's another example where Obviously, as you add more dependencies in your supply chain, you're increasing your risk. And so it's not about necessarily like prevention as much as understanding risk. And once you understand your risk, now you can start to control your risk. And so I think that's probably a better way to think of it. Do you think people are going to start making decisions like, I'm going to try to cut down the number of dependencies I have in my product? Is that like something people are going to do. Definitely. I, I think everyone I know, as soon as they start generating SBOMs and they look at the data, the first thing they say is, where did all this stuff come from? Every single person. And then obviously, but again, once you have data, you can start asking intelligent questions and solving yeah. problems, which is why data is magic and it's amazing. <laughs> So, oh, we have some of the results of the poll. So the question was, are you happy with your workflow for finding vulnerabilities in your software supply chain? And most people said yes. So bully to you. Yeah, we must have a security focused audience or that's proud awesome. of you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. And um, so it's like it's like five minutes to go. I thought that time absolutely flew by. Um, I'm just going to check if we have our. Oh, can I just say my favorite comment was he, from Jason, you need observability tools to observe the output of your observability tools, which is what we're all thinking about. Exception. So uh, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> it's just turtles all the way down. So uh, 
let, let's see. Um, Hillary, can we get a winner of the prize? Is that it? Is that it? Oh, oh, it's coming in. Okay, so we have free lunches for Judah Davis and Vinny Machione. I'm so sorry if I'm messing that up. And prize packs for Mike, Amea, and Chrissy Sutton. Oh, that's so nice. So that's brilliant. I, I hope you enjoy your free lunch and your prize pack. Apparently, the prize pack has the Kaismet socks, which are much coveted in, in at Kaismet. So, and that's pretty cool. So thank you to our guests today. We, I like loved chatting to you. I could talk to you all day long. Um, really appreciate you to come in for all your insights and everything. And I'd just like to say thanks to everybody for, for listening about observability. I hope you had an idea about how you can use observability to secure your supply chain and um, learn new things about your supply chain that maybe you didn't know that you had to ask when you collected all this data. So thanks so much and thanks for everybody for, for coming and listening to us. So, so next month we're talking about, um, oh, we're, it, we're talking to Luke Hines from Red Hat. So uh, stay tuned. But um, thanks again. So was, <laughs> this is a proper goodbye now. I'm sorry. <laughs> so okay, bye. bye everybody. Talk to you later.